Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for a little review of the Block 2 material. Uh, that would be chapters 4, 5, and 6, but I'm not going to review everything. I just wanted to focus on a few highlights of chapters 5 and 6 on the rate of change in momentum and the energy principle. I wanted to remind you that when you're solving problems in physics, it's always important to draw a picture of the situation, to, to sort of articulate what your understanding of the problem might be, to put forces in the diagram, uh, that would be called a free body diagram uh, by some people, but basically the idea is to identify the forces acting on the objects in question and uh, to clearly label them so that a person looking at your solution understands what it is you believe is producing the force and what is experiencing the force. It's always good to identify something as the system or some collection of things as the system and other things as the surroundings. And you may end up having to do that more than once depending on the complexity of the problem. And then to proceed to apply the momentum principle or the energy principle or possibly both to, to the problem. And uh, be as clear and deliberate as you can be about how you do that and I, I think it'll It'll go better for you in terms of uh, someone like me, for example, assessing your solution. It's good if I understand what you believe is the situation. So let's, let's start with an example of the energy principle. I wanted to describe a problem where we have a block sliding down a frictionless inclined plane. It's going to have the earth pulling down on it and the surface of the incline pushing up on it, uh, but no friction. So I'm going to neglect friction. And uh, it's important to notice that the, the weight force, the force of the earth pulling down on the block, can be decomposed into components perpendicular to and parallel to the plane. And I'm doing that because the plane is rigid and prevents any rate of change in momentum perpendicular to the surface of the plane. And that means that the net force in that direction has to be zero. So that means that the uh, force of the plane pushing back on the block has to exactly cancel the component of the weight perpendicular to the plane. So from that alone we can deduce the magnitude of the normal force or the, the force of the plane on the block. And that's useful to do. Now the notion is the block rolls or slides down the plane and we're going to neglect the friction. It's going to slide a distance L and uh, it's going to drop a distance h and go horizontally a distance l cosine theta. The distance h of course is l sine theta. And here the thing goes. It slides down and stops at the bottom. Well it doesn't actually stop but we're going to pretend we're going to stop considering its motion when it gets to the bottom. And uh, let's see if we can analyze that. So what I want to do first is to consider the block as the system and I want to use horizontal and vertical coordinates so that horizontal is the x direction and vertical is the y direction. Let's apply the energy principle to the problem and we can say that the change in the energy of the system is equal to the work done on the system by the surroundings. Since the, ener since the system consists of just the block then the energy of the block is just its rest energy plus its kinetic energy the rest energy doesn't change, so the change in the energy of the system is simply the change in the kinetic energy of the block. The work done on the system by the surroundings is the work done by the normal force plus the work done by the weight. So we want to work that out. Let's look at the normal force. It's going to have components in the x and y direction. You can see that uh, the magnitude of the normal force we already worked out was mg cosine theta. It's going to have an x component that goes like uh, the sine of theta and a vertical component that goes like the cosine of theta. In other words, you can think of the normal force as the magnitude of the normal force, mg cosine theta, times a unit vector that points in the direction of the normal force with an x component of sine theta and a y component of cosine theta. The weight, of course, is quite simple in this coordinate system. It's just 0, negative mg, 0. And delta r is L cosine theta minus H zero, which you can also think of as the magnitude of delta R L times a unit vector that points in the delta R direction. That's cosine theta minus sine theta zero. 
and uh, then we can compute the dot product of n dot delta r. That's the vector n dotted into the vi vector delta r. Of course, their magnitudes get multiplied, but also we get a dot product of the components, and you can see that that turns out to be sine theta cosine theta minus cosine theta sine theta, which clearly turns out to be zero. So the normal force dotted into the displacement turns out to be zero in this case. The weight dotted into the displacement is just mgh, because the y component of the weight is minus mg, the y component of the displacement is minus sine theta times L, and L sine theta is just, my, is just H. So the whole thing turns out to be plus MGH. So the work done on the system by the surroundings turns out to be nothing other than MGH. We can write that down and sort it out. But before we do that, I want to consider what would happen if we had picked a different coordinate system. What if we had picked a coordinate system that was tilted relative to the horizontal and vertical? So I want to run the calculation again, but this time make the system the block and make the coordinate system tilted so that the x direction is in the direction of the displacement, the y direction is in the direction of the normal force, and the weight is at a funny angle. So again, the change in the energy of the system is just the change in the kinetic energy. The, um, the normal force is much simpler this time. It's just 0, n, 0. But the magnitude of the normal force is mg cosine theta. The weight is now more complicated because the weight has an x component that's mg sine theta and a y component that's minus mg cosine theta. The displacement is quite simple, it's L0,0. Zero, zero. And you can see right away that the normal force is clearly orthogonal to the displacement, and the dot product of n dot delta r is zero because the n has only a y component and delta r has only an x component. So that's a little bit easier to see this time. The work done by the weight is uh, MGL sine theta because the displacement only has an x component, so we just look at the x component of the weight, and it's mg sine theta. But again, L sine theta is the change in height. Well, it's h. Um, and so the work done by gravity is again mgh, just a little more transparently this time. And the work done by the surroundings turns out again to be mgh. So that's kind of interesting. If I uh, write down the work done by the surroundings and set that equal to the change in the energy of the system, I get that the final kinetic energy, remember the initial kinetic energy is zero, so the final kinetic energy is just equal to mgh. That's a nice result. I can solve for the final velocity and I get the square root of 2gh. So uh, that's how you can calculate the final velocity of the block that slides down an inclined plane with no friction assuming the system is just the block and that the earth is external. So the earth does work on the system. I could just as easily have included the earth as part of the system. So let's do it again one more time with the earth being part of the system. In that case, the change in the energy of the system is the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the potential energy, mg delta y. Remember that near the surface of the Earth, the difference in potential energy between two points depends only on the difference in height. And uh, we know the initial velocity is zero. We know that delta Y is minus H. So that gives us the change in the energy of the system is 1 half mv final squared minus mgh. What's the work done on the system by the surroundings? Well, the only force that's left in the surroundings is the normal force. But we already know the work done by the normal force is zero. We've already worked that out with two different coordinate systems. So that means that the work done on the system by the surroundings is zero. And we just get that the change in the energy of the system is zero. And that means that 1 half mv final squared is equal to mgh. Notice that's the same result we got last time with the Earth in the surroundings. But we had to compute the work done by the Earth explicitly, but this time, we just calculated the change in potential energy. It turned out that the change in potential energy was the negative of the value we got for the work done by the Earth on the block the time before, but uh, 
the math, because the change in the energy was on the other side of the equal sign, turned out the same. So we get the final velocity is the square root of 2gh either way. The point is, um, if we summarize the results, we can put the block as the system in horizontal and vertical coordinates, or we can use the block as the system in tilted coordinates. In either case, the change in the energy of the system is just the change in kinetic energy. The work done on the system by the surroundings was the work done by the normal force plus the work done by the weight. In those two cases, the work done by the normal force was zero, the work done by the weight, the earth pulling down, was mgh. Or we could treat the block and the earth as the system, then the change in the energy of the system includes the change in the gravitational potential energy of the block, which is minus mgh. The work done on the system by the surroundings turns out to be zero if you do that, and but the, the result you get in the end, if you think of the result as the final velocity of the block or the speed of the block at the bottom, you get the same answer no matter how you pick what's in the system and what isn't. I'll point out that in systems where the force is more complicated, if you can use the potential energy concept, you can save yourself a lot of calculation because you don't have to bother to compute the work, which can be much more difficult than the problem we just did. Okay, let's look at a different example. Here's an example where a block slides up an inclined plane, it starts with some kinetic energy, and it ends up with no kinetic energy. So it's basically the opposite problem. As you can imagine, it ends up uh, with a very similar result. There's an analogous problem where you fire an alpha particle at a gold nucleus, and the uh, alpha particle has some initial kinetic energy, and it winds up uh, right up next to the gold nucleus, stopping at a distance d. The center of the gold nucleus and the alpha particle are a distance d apart, and the thing comes to rest. I want to point out that these two problems are actually extremely similar, because the energy principle in both cases, uh, if you include the earth and the block in the system, in the case of the inclined plane, and you include the gold nucleus and the alpha particle as the system, put them both in the system in the case of the alpha particle, the, uh, the equations work out exactly the same way in the sense that the change in the energy is equal to the work done on the system by the surroundings, which turns out to be zero in both cases. So the change in the potential energy plus the change in the kinetic energy is zero. The potential energy goes up, the kinetic energy goes down, and because the kinetic energy ends up at zero, and the potential energy starts out at zero, the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final potential energy. And uh, you can see the same equations apply in both problems. Now I should emphasize that uh, when I say the potential energy starts at zero, I'm talking about the relative potential energy in the case of the block but it's the absolute potential energy in the case of the gold nucleus. Let's push on this a little bit harder just to show how the problems do differ a little bit. In the case of the block, the initial kinetic energy is 1 half mv naught squared, but the final potential energy is mg delta y, whereas in the case of the alpha particle, the final potential energy is the electrostatic potential energy of interaction between the positive charge of the alpha particle and the positive charge of the gold nucleus. In both cases, we can solve for the final velocity. Uh, but in the case of the alpha particle, it turns out the mass uh, of the alpha particle is important in finding the final velocity, whereas the mass cancels in the case of the gravitational case, the gra gravitational situation. Okay, I want to do one last example, and then we'll be... Okay, so let's do another example. Remember, we did the experiment in the lab with the pig on a string flying around in a circle. And we also did a homework problem with the star orbiting the galactic core. So we're going to see how these two problems, which appear to be utterly different, are actually the same. So first for the pig. You know, if you look at the pig from above, you see a pig circling around the center of a circle at a distance capital R. And if you look at it from the front, it appears to be a pig on a string circling around at a distance capital R. And uh, that's all there is to it. Now, the galactic core, superficially at least, 
has a similar diagram, but is it the same physics? From the front, it appears to be a star heading toward you, a distance capital R from the center of the galaxy. Now let's look at these um, as they appear in a free body diagram. So for example, the pig has a force from the string acting on the pig and the force of the earth acting on the pig. If you uh, think about the momentum principle, the rate of change of the momentum is the net force, which is there's only two forces, the tension and the weight. I can break those into X and Y components. Then I get that the X component of the rate of change of momentum, that's the perpendicular part, is mv squared over r in the low speed limit. This is a pig, so it's probably not relativistic. And the only force that has a component in that direction is the tension. And the component of the tension, of course, is t times the sine of the angle theta. In the y direction, there's no rate of change of momentum because the pig is moving in a horizontal circle. And so the x component or the y component of the tension, t cosine theta, must be exactly balanced by the y component of the weight minus mg. And uh, the galactic core, of course, is even simpler because we've got the rate of change of momentum is equal to the net force, but there is only one net force, and that's the force of the galactic core acting gravitationally on the star. It only has an x component. The x component, of course, is mv squared over r. In the homework problem we did, the particular star in question turned out to be non-relativistic. It was moving at less than 10% the speed of light, so we can approximate that as non-relativistic. And the force, of course, is nothing other than the Newton's universal law of gravitation. So we can uh, hang on to those equations, simplify a little bit, and then solve for the speed of the pig. It turns out to depend only on the local strength of the gravitational field and the angle of the string relative to the vertical. And of course, we can also solve for the speed of the star orbiting the galactic core. And of course, the expressions are very different, but the physics, essentially, the momentum principle applied to something moving in a circle is pretty much the same. So that's the main idea. I wanted to point out that the perpendicular component of the rate of change of momentum is produced by a force, and the force is very different in these two situations, but the physics is basically identical. And that's it. All right, we'll see you guys next time.